It won't be long before we're up at zero G Up of the atmosphere, just you and me and me Planet Tokyo, it's a place of very far In your stereo, it's as close as where you are On the radio, it's a sound that you can see Planet Tokyo Hello there, Thrill Seekers. That was a little snippet of Planet Tokyo, the most expensive video I've ever made. I had to go to Japan to make it. Not enough of you are watching that video, so go watch the whole video. I'll leave a link in the description below. So, uh, I chose to make that the opening of this video because I want to talk about Zen and Japanese culture. And that's the title of a book by D.T. Suzuki, a, a classic book that's still in print, one of those many classic books that's still in print that I've never read, but I'm aware of the book. And I'm kind of aware of the combo of Zen and Japanese culture in a kind of a personal way. So that's what I want to talk about. While I was over in Japan, what was it, two weeks ago, I guess, uh, I, I put up a tweet or something, I can't remember, maybe it was a Facebook post, but I said that I think trying to separate Japanese culture out of Zen is kind of like trying to remove the eggs from a cake that's already been baked. Uh, it's not an easy task. And the best you're going to be able to do is to try to figure out how to make an eggless cake yourself, if that's what you want to do, breaking the metaphor by extending it too far. And one of the examples of how how this can work out, and this is a kind of a, a tenuous example, I know, but I want to put it in here because I spent some time getting visual aids for this one. So when I was in uh, Tassajara one year, I watched a lecture by a guy who I know is a pretty decent pretty good, actually. I, I don't want to damn him with faint praise. He's good. A Buddhist scholar who gave a lecture about this famous line in Dogen where he's describing what to do with your mind, with your brains, while you are meditating. And you've, if you've watched my video channel or read my books, you've heard this before, but I'm going to do it again with visual aids. The example he gave, or the, 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 the Dogen quotes, is usually, well, is translated by Nishijima Roshi and Mike Cross as, think the thought of non-thinking. What is the thought of non-thinking? It's different from thinking. There are various other translations of this phrase, but the key point is that what Dogen says the first time is fushiryo. Shidio means consideration more than it means thinking, but let's uh, let's save that for another day and focus on the fu. So the first time when he says, think the thought of not thinking, what he's actually saying is, is do fushidio. And the anonymous questioner or the hypothetical questioner says, what is the thought of not thinking? And Dogen says, hishidio. So I put those on the screen for those of you watching and not just listening. So this guy who was giving the lecture said, well, basically, fu and he are both the same thing. They're both prefixes that mean not. Uh, we have the same thing in, in English, like uh, caffeinated and non-caffeinated, or uh, I don't know, legal and illegal. That's actually a good example, uh, but we'll get to that. And when I heard him say that, immediately my ears went bing or something. I don't know what happened. Immediately I had a reaction because I'm like, no, Fu and he are not the same. But the reason you would think they're the same uh, is because this guy who's the scholar I'm talking about, he learned his Japanese while living in America. Uh, I, I think maybe he's been to Japan a couple of times, but he's never actually lived there. So he doesn't have the experience of on the ground in Japan for his linguistic understanding of Japanese. Uh, whereas I do, and I'm not trying to say I'm better than him, but it's, it, it does give me a sort of an advantage in areas like this. And I'll tell you why I know that he is different from Fu, uh, the, the kanji he, 
is, is different from the kanji fu in meaning. And I took some pictures while I was in Japan to show you this. Uh, here are some examples of the way he appears in Japanese. You, you see it on signs in the train station a lot, and this is where I took uh, most of these photos. Uh, he is the kanji, the first kanji, the first Chinese character in the word hijo, which means emergency. And if you actually take apart the kanji for hijo, it means unusual. I mean, that, that this would be the, the, the way this Buddhist scholar was translating it. He would probably translate hijo as unusual. But hijo does not mean unusual. It means emergency. And as you can see in these examples, it's often written in bright red uh, on, uh, on signs for like emergency stop buttons or emergency this or that things. Uh, and here's another example where I, I found the character he. I was given some tickets to an Ultraman festival while I was there, and on the tickets it says Hibaihin, and that means literally not for sale, but using that that he kanji at the beginning uh, gives the impression of sale is forbidden. It's it's a strong negation. So when Dogen says fushiryo, he's giving a kind of light negation. Uh, he, he, like, just don't think. And in when he says hishiro, he's going, it's totally, totally different from thinking. Like, it's totally not thinking. Like, the difference between legal and illegal. So, there is something that one gets from actually being ensconced in the culture that you can't get from watching it outside, which is a slightly tenuous example, but I wanted to give it. The other thing that I think is actually more salient, salient? That's one of those big words I don't know how to use. It, it's more um, specifically related to this, is uh, years and years ago, I was in a museum, and I came across this exhibit that seared itself in my brain because usually these kind of things would not be interesting to me, but I was like, this one was really interesting. And it was an exhibit on the development of porcelain, a.k.a. China. Uh, we often refer to porcelain by the name China in English. And why do we do this? Well, that's what this exhibit was all about. What happened was after Marco Polo and some of those people made their journeys to China, they brought back porcelain to the West. And Europeans did not know, they, they had no porcelain then. They only, the pot, pottery was done with clay. They didn't know what porcelain was, and they were amazed by this stuff that was very light, but very strong. And, well, you can break it, but, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, they didn't, they didn't know how to make it. And so the exhibit showed the development. Apparently, the Chinese were reluctant to export very much uh, porcelain back in those days. And I don't know the whole details about that. But uh, so it was hard to get real China in Europe. So the Europeans tried to figure out how to make China. But they didn't know. <laughs> they didn't know what it was made of. And the Chinese were not telling them. So... They, they go through these, this exhibit showed the various stages of how different European makers had eventually cracked the code and figured out how to make China. But their early attempts were very clunky and kind of ugly. Uh, they would just basically take clay, fired clay, and then paint it white and then put a glaze on it or something. And But it was like heavy and bulky and it wasn't porcelain. It wasn't China. So... I think that's kind of analogous to what is happening in Zen or with other forms of Buddhism too, but Zen is the one I know best. When you're trying to bring Zen to the West, it's all it's all wrapped up. Like, like somebody responded to my tweet or was it the Facebook post or whatever it was uh, by saying, I always thought of it as uh, Zen came packaged in a nice and a beautiful Japanese wrapper and we just need to take off the wrapper. But I think that's a bad analogy. It's much more complicated than that. It's much more infused into everything. So going back to Japan for the first time in, God, I think since 20. 20, 2009, I think, or 2010 uh, was the last time I was in Japan uh, before this year. Uh, and I really got hit with it in a way that you can't just by 
intellectually thinking about it or remembering it or whatever, just kind of hit by and struck by how much of, of this Zen is intertwined into Japanese culture. And as I've said often, most of the people I interacted with on a day-to-day -day basis in Japan were not Zen people. They were not people who were interested in Buddhism at all. They were mostly people who worked for Tsuburaya Productions. And just as an aside, I reached out to some of the Zen people I know in Japan and nobody got back to me. But the Tsuburaya Productions people, they got back to me and they hung out with me. So there's something about Zen there. Uh, maybe Shozan Jack Haubner would have an answer for that one because he's talked about the coldness of Zen people. But anyway, no, 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 none of my Zen friends uh, got back to me, but my Tsuburai Productions friends did. So I hung around with those people who were, you know, they might have been nominally Buddhists. A lot of Japanese people are Buddhists, but they don't know nothing about Buddhism. But it's it's infused into the culture. A good example is bowing. Bowing it comes from Japanese temple, not Japanese, sorry, Buddhist temple practice. And Japanese people, when Buddhist temples started to exist in Japan in the Middle Ages, uh, saw the monks doing that and were like, hey, maybe we should do that too. And it, it became part of, of the culture. But it, there's a back and forth that's been going on for, you know, when did I think the uh, Zen first or Buddhism first got introduced to Japan in the 600s, 600 AD, uh, and got really uh, started in earnest as a practice around the time of Dogen, around 1200 AD. So for 800 or depending on how you want to look at it a thousand almost a thousand years it's been infused into the culture and the zen we are getting from japanese teachers i mean i know there are chinese teachers and thai teachers and, and people like that who are who are also coming out but i know the japanese side so the zen that, that's coming from the the japanese teacher is infused with the culture and to try to extract it, extract the real Zen from the culture is uh, is not an easy task and people are trying to do it but I think we should proceed cautiously with this kind of thing because you know the, the, to, to use an old metaphor it's like throwing the baby out with the bath water you know the kind of thing you don't want to throw out the good stuff with the bad stuff and trying to figure out which is pure zen and which is japanese culture it's almost impossible i mean what is the egg in the in the baked cake you know where is the egg now uh, you don't know, but it's a, it's an intrinsic part of the, the cake, and it it, uh, it makes a difference. So that's kind of what I want to say, and I know this isn't. There's no conclusion I have for you. If you're if you're working on, or if you're really concerned about extricating Japanese or whatever Asian culture from your Buddhism, uh, good luck to you. <laughs> My advice would be, if you're following a Japanese teacher, or if you're following somebody like me who has been to Japan and studied it in Japan, uh, just do just just follow what they tell you to do. Um, I'm not trying to say, you know, listen to every... Anyway, we're not going to go into that whole guru idea of where gurus go bad and you can't do everything they tell you to do. But, you know, just in general, do the practice the way it, you, you receive it. And then a few generations later, after you're dead and gone, uh, maybe your descendants will have figured out how to make a truly American or truly French or truly German or, or who, wherever you're listening to this, this video uh, style of Buddhism. But right now, uh, I think it's early days and I don't think it's possible to, to do it without just kind of wrecking everything. So that's my, my, my little uh, spiel about that. I, I, hope, uh, I hope that was at least somehow interesting. And uh, if you want to donate to me making more interesting videos like this, you can go to the URL that you're seeing on your screen below, which is hardcorezen.info slash donate. That is hardcorezen, oops, hardcorezen.info slash donate. I can't actually, can't actually see the words on the screen. I like to figure out, and then when I do it in editing, I'm always like impressed if I actually pointed at the right words. Anyway, 
So just uh, send your donations there via Patreon and PayPal. That's my main way of making a living, and I really appreciate your support. But you don't have to support me if you don't want to support me. Also, uh, I will put up, as I did yesterday and I've been doing for the last month or so, uh, the list of places I'm going to be in Europe starting in like two weeks or less than two weeks. I don't know. Uh, so uh, all of the events are open to uh, participants, and especially the Hebden Bridge one. Uh, they sent me an email saying they were a little concerned uh, not enough people were signing up for the Hebden Bridge and Hebden Bridge is a wonderful place and we're doing a retreat there uh, for three days it's non-residential which has uh, some benefits if you don't like sleeping together with a bunch of uh, people in the same room well you got an option this year because we're doing it non-residentially so that's a good thing uh, so uh, come sign up for the Hebden Bridge retreat if you're anywhere near the UK or the retreat in Benedictushof they'll probably let you in at the last minute they have a cutoff but I've known them to uh, to extend that uh, the Finland retreat uh, also a good one uh, and uh, I don't know about this uh, place this thing in Italy, uh, whether they have spaces or not, but you can go ask them and see what's going on with them. I think they want some, some more people to show up. Anyway, please be there. All right, we'll see you next time. Have a good time all the time. Bye. What do you think of that? Do you think you can extract dog culture from barking or dog culture from biskies? Things like that? From cuteness? you think you can extract dog culture from dog cuteness? I think it's difficult. All right, we'll talk to you later, Ziggy. Bye. Yeah.